Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining once again for the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna Prabhu. I'm happy to be here again. It's amongst wonderful. the monks. <laughs> to be amongst the monks. <laughs> amongst the monks. <laughs> Actually, you're giving me the opportunity to be amongst a monk, a senior monk. I think this is the longest series we have been having on the Monks Podcast. I've discussed various issues with different devotees, but it's been a consistent theme for meditation. So it's wonderful. And uh, we are going toward, I think, Krishna next time. This is today's Lord Ram. So, Today, I think, is Ram, no? Yes, Maharaj. Ram. Yeah. So, you know, on Lord Ram, actually, I grew up hearing stories of Ram. We had pictures of Ram in our homes. Right behind our childhood, we, right behind my home, there was a temple of Ram. So, in one sense, from a cultural connection with Lord Ram is more than with Lord Krishna. This is my upbringing. Uh-huh. And I've written some... Your, your upbringing was uh, which part of it, India? Mostly Maharashtra. My parents were from Andhra, grandparents, but I was born and brought up in Maharashtra. So Which part? I lived in... I was born in the heartland of Maharashtra, in a remote place called Chandrapur. I grew up over oh. there. That is, it is still considered to be like a rural or a tribal area almost. Then I came oh. to Nasik. So my youth was in Nasik. Then I came to study in Mumbai, in, in Pune for my engineering. And that's mm-hmm. where I was introduced to Krishna consciousness. So yeah. was, <laughs> in Chandrapur, I had a lot of exposure to Lord Ram because just behind our home, there was a Ram temple. So... So lot- you have Lord Ram in your blood. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Any blood? Okay, yeah, in, at least in my psyche, somewhere is there. Krishna, hopefully, by Krishna's mercy. Mm. Yeah, you've been so much blessed. I didn't, I didn't hear, I don't think I, I don't think I heard about Lord Rama until... I joined the devotees, which means I was 20, 21 years old. Oh. So uh, I'm, I'm a late starter. <laughs> oh, well, you, have, you have taken leaps and bounds and you're helping many others to start early now by your outreach. But were you from a more of religious or spiritual inclination, your background earlier, Maharaj? Yeah, there was a there was a strong religious orientation in Protestant Christian uh, tradition, um, and it's a bit complicated. Um, but I was uh, understanding that there's there's some higher reality from you know from very early. I would say. And uh, I had some kind of attraction, some vague attraction to to religious life and then spiritual life. And then in my co- early college days, I became attracted to yoga teachings. And then I heard about bhakti, bhakti yoga. And when I met devotees in Germany, they said, we practice bhakti yoga. And I immediately thought, "Uh aha, I think I've found what I'm looking for. (laughs) Oh, amazing. If I'm not mistaken, you're from America, but you met devotees in Germany. I actually met devotees in America first, but I didn't... um, I didn't interact with them. Uh, I saw them and heard them at my university. They would have kirtan every day in um, on the on the streets in the open area, just next, just next to the main entrance to the university park area. So they were definitely impressing me gradually at that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, 
but it was in Germany that I first uh, interacted with devotees. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, Shivananda Prabhu and Pritu Prabhu. They were pioneers in German Yatra back then. Yeah, I think that book. About Prabhupada in Germany. Prabhupada's disciple. I think, what is that book called? About the Disciples in Germany. It's quite a. Yeah, Srila Prabhupada's Disciples in Germany. Germany. Yeah, right. Yes, Maharaj. So. So I thought of talking about Lord Ram from one perspective, but if you have something in mind, we can go along. <clears throat> well, I thought we should uh, we should hear first uh, Sri Jayadev Goswami's oh yes beautiful prayer yeah yes yes <clears throat> and then I thought we could go to also one of the prayers in the ninth canto, which is interesting because it gives benediction and it describes practically the whole pastime of the Lord's appearance all in one verse. So let's start with uh, the Dashavatara Stotra. Vitarasi dikshurane dikpati kamaniyam dashamukha mauli balim ramaniyam Keshavadritta Ragupati Rupa Jaya Jagadisha Hari. And I have a translation here. You scattered in all directions, all ten directions, the severed heads of Ravana as a beautiful offering to the deities of the various quarters, east, west, and so on. Oh, Keshava, you took the form of Rama. So it's interesting. Dasha Mukha Mauli Balim Ramaniya. His ten heads were offered. I think the literal meaning would be as balidana, as yes. as an offering to the uh, to the directional uh, divinities. <laughs> this is beautiful. So, Maharaj, just a quick. I had this question, and I have a particular understanding. I want to confirm from you. So, generally, when the Lord is glorified, so. The glorification, especially in poetic form, need not necessarily be a literal truth, isn't it? Because as far as I have read in the Ramayana, it's not that his ten heads were cut and sent in ten directions. It's more like that his heart was shot. That's the Valmiki Ramayana version. And uh, the Pulfi Ramayana is that there was a his life force was in his belly. His belly was shot, and he had the power yeah. to regenerate his head. So uh, even if his heads were cut, they would reappear again. And I don't <laughs> think that after he was killed, after that, they would do anything to his corpse. And Ram was not a kind of person who would, uh, who would <laughs> deform or deface the corpse of a dead enemy. So, yeah. Well, this is kind of a bigger topic, especially in relation to Ram Leela. Uh, we can maybe talk more about it later, but uh, there are so many versions of yes, Ram Lila. And we can, we can say, of course, we can say, well, the only really bona fide is Valmiki Ramayana. Um, yeah, we can discuss that. But I, 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 I like to think that uh, the Lord's pastimes are, are unlimited. And so there can be variations. Oh, beautiful. And uh, the variations, of course, can also, one can invoke uh, kalpa beda nyaya, we can say in different kalpas, the variations appear. That would be one way, oh, okay. one way to say it. But yeah. let's, uh, 
Let's now go to a verse in the Bhagavatam. Which verse is Maharaj? Nine? Canto 9, chapter 10, verse 4. Okay. And I like to read the Sanskrit, if I may, because it's, uh, it's one of the longer uh, meters. I don't remember. Shagdara, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Gurvarte Chattaraja Vyacharadanuvanam Padma Padbyam Priyaya Pani Sparshaksham Abhyam Mrijita Patarujo Yo Harindranu Javyam Bhai Rupyachur Panakya Priyavira Harash Rushor Ropita Bruvrijimba Trustab Dear Badha Setu Kala Dahana Koshalendro Vatana. That takes more practice to chant properly. To keep the promise of his father intact. Lord Ramachandra immediately gave up the position of king and, accompanied by his wife, Mother Sita, wandered from one forest to another on his lotus feet, which were so delicate that they were unable to bear even the touch of Sita's palms. The Lord was also accompanied by Hanuman, king of the monkeys, or by another monkey, Sugriva, and by his own younger brother, Lord Lakshmana, both of whom gave him relief from the fatigue of wandering in the forest. Having cut off the nose and ears of Shurpanaka, thus disfiguring her, the Lord was separated from Mother Sita. He therefore became angry, moving his eyebrows and thus frightening the ocean, who then allowed the Lord to construct a bridge to cross the ocean. Subsequently, the Lord entered the kingdom of Ravana to kill him like a fire devouring a forest. May that Supreme Lord, Ramachandra, give us all protection. So it's a prayer of benediction, which is also a uh, quite an extensive description of the pastime with a few details which could also be discussed. Um, and it's interesting just to consider the Bhagavatam version of Ramalila. Um, you know, the fact that it's um, rel relative to, let's say, Valmiki Ramayana, it's extremely short. It's two chapters. And Shukadev Goswami in the beginning says to Maras Parikshit, I'm just going to give you a short summary because you already are familiar with the story. Mm. So it's assumed, one can say, not only that Maharaj Parikshit is familiar, but also any reader of the Bhagavatam is familiar. Similar to in the first canto, much of the first canto is a kind of uh, sequel to the Mahabharata with some overlap also of uh, later portions of the Mahabharata and of course very much summarizing. But the assumption is that one is already familiar with the Mahabharata, and that's what gives uh, significance to the, to the Bhagavatam uh, sequel and summary, because one's already familiar with it, and now one gets 
you know, the particular perspective, which can also be considered a kind of commentary uh, to the Mahabharata. And now in the ninth canto, we can also take these two chapters as kind of commentary on uh, the Ramayana of Valmiki. That's an interesting point. But normally, I never thought of it as a commentary because isn't technically a commentary said to, said to be like a bigger than the original book? Or <laughs> is it? I, I, my, my, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily? Okay. Yeah, okay. No, uh, Sridhar Swami's commentary on the Gita is often quite brief for certain verses. For other verses, he elaborates more, uh, but sometimes okay. it's short. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I also thought about this. It's remarkably brief. And there are some, in some ways, Shukde Goswami is also presenting things from the perspective that is uh, most relevant for, say, Parikshit Maharaj. Most of the Bhagavatam, mm -hmm. they are pastimes which are focused on the idea of, say, renunciation of the world and attachment mm -hmm. to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the one of the things which first struck me as quite odd, but then as I read the mood of try to understand the mood of the Bhagavatam, it uh, I appreciated a little bit more. I would like to get your understanding also. The Bhagavatam says that that in order to demonstrate how somebody who is attached to their, their spouse, their wife gets, suffers, the whole pastime mm -hmm. of uh, Ram being exiled happened. Yes, and Prabhupada mentioned that once. Um, in my memory, it was uh, in a talk, maybe it was a conversation in Hyderabad. And he was, as I remember, he was kind of chuckling about it. He said, what is, what is the uh, essential lesson of the Ramayana? The essential lesson is how much trouble it is to have a wife. <laughs> so my understanding of that perspective is that also that it's from the the Parikshit Maharaj has to be detached from, he has renounced everything yeah. and focus on the Lord. Yeah. And in that sense that it is encouraging him to do that. But uh, yes. you know, in India, especially that idea of, that means you know, just to teach something, Ram let Sita get accused and he didn't come to her defense and he exiled her when she was pregnant. So it seems quite a questionable thing to do. So just to teach the lesson of detachment, Sita, Sita is made to suffer for no fault of hers. Uh, yeah. It does seem a little objectionable. So my understanding was <laughs> yeah. that that, uh, that is from the Bhagavatam's perspective of helping a person to become detached, a person who is in the position of Parishit Maharaj. But... Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Shukade Goswami had a very specific task um, which was to, as you point out, it was to help Maharaj Pariksit prepare, <clears throat> prepare for the inevitable, excuse me, which was going to happen very soon. Uh, and so, as you say, renunciation was, um, or it, it's, it's, you can say, a very dominant theme of the whole the whole Bhagavatam, and therefore, in that theme, um, with that flavor, you can say, he's speaking these two chapters. But now I have a question. Why is it that he emphasizes, in this verse we just read, how delicate Ram's feet are? They're so delicate He's wandering in the forest, so delicate that they were unable to bear even the touch of Sita's palms. <laughs> it's almost an echo of what that comes in the 10th canto, or we could not echo, we could say a precursor. 
of what they will yeah. describe about Krishna and the gopis. And yeah, anticipation. Yeah. Anticipation. Okay, yeah. that's a good. That's a good answer uh, because there are a lot of passages in the first nine cantos that are anticipating. Uh, hinting at or somehow anticipating uh, points or elements in the 10th canto. Yeah. Another thought I had. It's also, also yeah. and because of that, you can say it's, it's hinting at uh, the Madhurya relationship between Rama and Sita, isn't it? Yes, definitely. It's a uh... It's also maybe one way is that it's also to illustrate his renunciation. That if he was so used to comfort and then he accepted so much, uh, so much uh, austerity. And what uh, is the first word over there? That he he did it because of is to honor the word of his father. So, yeah, that's another way of looking at it. And. Yeah. It's but it's also interesting yeah. in this verse. Uh, it's also interesting that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says here that uh, it was Lord Rama who disfigures Shurpanaka. Um, I was thinking it was Lakshmana who does that. Yes, it is. I mean, maybe you can say that. Uh, well, I think we discussed this thing of performative utterance. That it is. Ram's instruction, which did that. So in that sense, Ram told Lakshman to do that. Oh, I see. Okay. So, And, and then there's this emphasis on uh, the interaction that Rama has, again, still this verse, between Rama and the ocean. Um, he becomes angry says he therefore become, became angry uh, because he was separated from Mother Sita. Yeah. So, and then he therefore became angry, moving his eyebrows <laughs> and thus frightening the ocean. So all it took for him to frighten the ocean was to move his eyebrows yeah. Who then submits to him. And, um, and there are two prayers. Uh, I won't be able to find so quickly now, but uh, there are two prayers of the ocean uh, to Lord Rama. Oh, here they are. Uh, verses 14 and 15. Oh, okay our prayers by the ocean to the Lord. It's interesting that the Ramayana described that first Lord Ram tried the peaceful way uh, and he actually performed austerities to appease the uh, God of the ocean, Samudra Dev. And Samudra Dev didn't do it, listen and then Lord Ram got or enraged, and it's described that all the aquatics, that, that this huge wave started billowing in the ocean, the aquatics started getting burnt. The ocean uh, starts boiling. <laughs> yeah. They fasted for three days. You want to go to Sanskrit, Maharaj, or should we read the English? Um, where are we? Verse, verse 14? 14, 14, 13, yeah, 13 is a description that he, he became fearful. Oh, right. Okay, uh, 14, let's just do the English. Yeah. Oh, all pervading supreme person, we are dull minded and did not understand who you are. But now we understand that you are the supreme person, the master of the entire universe, the unchanging and original personality of Godhead. The demigods are infatuated with the mode of goodness, the prajapadis with the mode of passion, and the lord of ghosts with the mode of ignorance, but you are the master of all these qualities. And then the next verse, he, he makes the point, uh, the practical point, 
my Lord, you may use my water as you like. Indeed, you may cross it and go to the abode of Ravana, who is the great source of disturbance and crying for the three worlds. He is the son of Vishrava, but is condemned like urine. Please go kill him and thus regain your wife, Sita Devi. O great hero, although my water presents no impediment to your going to Lanka, please construct a bridge over it to spread your transcendental fame. Upon seeing this wonderfully uncommon deed of your lordship, all the great heroes and kings in the future will glorify you. So the verse is, it's saying, yes, please do it. And then it's going on to, in effect, to describe what's going to happen in the future. He is going to build this bridge and this setu, and then he's going to kill Ravana. So it's an anticipation, but again, uh, Maharaj Prikshit already knows the story. Yeah. And we also all already know the story. And as you said, you know it since childhood. But hearing it again and again and again is always enlivening. Why is that? Why is it that uh, Krishna Leela works in that way? I read an article um, by a scholar who attended the Ram Leela performance um, in R Ram Nagar, just across the Ganga from Varanasi. And uh, she attended the entire one month performance and she describes it in quite some detail, uh, what a, uh, the, the whole atmosphere, how everything goes on. And uh, she's describing the, the mood of the audience. And she mentions that many of the audience, well, everyone in the audience already knows the whole story. They are, um, performing not Valmiki Ramayana, but Ram Charitmanas of Tulsi Das. Yeah. And she says many of the audience have practically the whole Tulsi Ramayana memorized. They already know it. <laughs> so someone in the West could say, well, I don't want to see, okay, sometimes I'll see a film more than once. I already know what's going to happen. I want to see it again. But again and again and again and again, no. There's no need for that. But somehow with Krishna Leela and Rama Leela, we want to see it again and again and again. Yeah. Also, also, also the uh, late 1980s television performance or television broadcast that went for more than a year in India, uh, for, um, directed by, I'm forgetting his name, was it Ram Ramanan Sagar? Ramanan Sagar. Ramanan Sagar, yeah. Um, the, the reports are that every Sunday morning when that was broadcast, India would come to a stop. Practically, it was like lockdown. <laughs> everyone, everyone just stopped and watched the Ramayana. Yes, I remember that. You know, we were so, we were in a remote place at that time. 
and we didn't have tv but we would go to our neighbor's place or go somewhere else like many yeah. of our uh, neighbors bought television just because to to watch that serial <laughs> <laughs> and some villages again i read i read about this some villages maybe there would be only one uh television in the whole village they would get an extension cord and they would bring it out uh to the village square or whatever uh and everyone would gather around and some and they they might also put a garland or garlands around the the tv screen <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> they actually do not in the garden they would actually have arti plate ready and first time lord ram would appear to do arti yeah, yeah. i remember that <laughs> in fact recently maharaj during the pandemic the indian because there was a complete lockdown the indian yeah. government decided to retelecast the ramayan oh uh, because people had to stay at home and since uh-huh. they had this cracked all records i'm just looking at the stats it seems that they had something like 4.9 billion viewing hours 6.9 billion viewing viewing minutes for just the four first four episodes acha <laughs> and 93.3 billion billion viewers so uh. it is it is far more than any of the popular uh, television shows in america or anywhere else in the world and yeah. the amazing thing is all this is not only already broadcast but it's already available on youtube freely for anybody to watch but uh-huh. let's feel it was there and it is it's the appeal is enduring even now yeah. <laughs> yes varaj so so what is that author's uh, who is that author maharaj is this from that vasudha narayanan's book life of hinduism i remember reading something about it there also about the ram lila uh about ram lila in ram nagar yeah the article oh um that article where was it uh, i would have to look it's been okay. a while so what was um, the what was the conclusion by the way means what was the reasoning how why are people so attracted did she give a spiritual explanation or some sociological psychological explanation uh it's been so long since i read it Um, okay. but she she was deeply appreciating she's not oh. you know she's not a religion basher <laughs> oh okay she's appreciating that how much dedicated people are and she she points out you know some days some days it was raining um but this doesn't stop anyone everyone is coming sitting in the mud doesn't matter and also she was highlighting how uh the the audience become actually participants uh they feel themselves to be in effect uh like residents of ayodhya so that when ram in in the drama when ram leaves for the forest um they actually move they physically go on a procession and they go to a different part of ramnagar and the entire audience is going in this mood that uh we are residents of ayodhya and so in that in that mood that it's it's participation and i i would say that's her perhaps her main conclusion i'm i'm experiencing what is called abhava abhava is uh one of the 10 pramanas of classical nyaya it's the experience of the absence of something or someone just like uh lord ramachandra was experiencing the absence of sita so now we are experiencing the absence of chaitanya charan prabhu 
we see his chair and we see that he is not there. <laughs> Sorry, Maharaj. Net had got disconnected, so I just called up the person. Ah, okay. That's all right. We we discussed um, in your absence. We discussed. I was hearing. I was just hearing that. I heard everything you we said. Were discussing Nyaya. <laughs> you mentioned about Anubhav and how that is the no, highest human. Abhav. Abhav. Abhav, okay. I thought. Abhav is one of the ten forms of, uh, of one type of pramana. And it's uh, the sense of absence. Oh, okay. Abhav. It's the awareness that something is not present. That's fascinating. So, yeah. Uh, I thought of Anubhav, which is like one of. So you were not present. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I was relating this to Ram Lila because Lord Ram was feeling that Sita was not present. Yes. And there, therefore we have a drama. I want to share one, one more verse from the Bhagavatam, a famous one. Uh, this is uh, quoted in Lagu Bhagavatamrita, but it's in the Bhagavatam, it's uh, Canto uh, 11, oh. and it's spoken by Karabhajana Muni. I, I don't remember. I think it's, it's either Chapter 2 or Chapter 5. That one, Tektva The words the Tektva Dustaja? Yes. Yeah. And here, oh, here it is, 11.534. Oh, Mahapurusha, I worship your lotus feet as the most faithful follower of religious principles, you honored the words of your respected father and went to the forest, abandoning royal splendor so opulent that the demigods desired it. In the forest, you chased after the illusory deer desired by your beloved consort. And commentators explain, uh, this is elaborated in the purport, that this same verse can be applied to or uh, can be taken as describing uh, also Lord Krishna's pastimes and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. Yes. So it has a triple a triple meaning depending how you take the words, um, but uh, we may say the uh, initial understanding is that it's referring to Lord Rama. Uh, and in uh, mm, this short commentary of Gopi Paranadana Prabhu in the Lagu Bhagavatamrita, it says. This verse can alternately, alternatively be taken as Karabhajana's description of the Lord rather than an homage directed to him, in which case the word Dharmishta, or virtuous one, is directed to Nimi Maharaj. Oh, okay. So it's just, he's pointing out, it can be taken either as a description or as praising, as addressing the Lord. Oh, okay. Anyway, that's um, that's a nice verse uh, for one reason because the next verse um, is about Lord Caitanya. 
is about Lord Chaitanya, yeah, specifically. Yeah. Okay, I am finished with the verses I wanted to quote. Now you wanted to discuss. Thank you, Maharaj. It's a beautiful thing, a scriptural, as we said, a lot of scriptural verses, but this is a very good uh, meditation on how meditation on how Lord Ram has been appreciated in different portions of scripture by different uh, different teachers in our tradition or by acharyas in our tradition. So, so one of the things which uh, I have been working on with respect to the Ramayana is when I grew up, it was we learned more uh, human values than devotional values from the Ramayana. Human values means that uh, how Ram, how yeah, the younger brother should obey the uh, uh, older brother, the children should obey their parents, the wives should follow their husbands, how we should honor our work. So of course, it's all Ram-centric and we understood that Ram was God. But uh, that rigid differentiation between, say, what we might call as mundane lessons and spiritual lessons was not there. It is all a part of organic, organic teaching. So in terms of what was uplifting us. And there is uh, some, one of the most prom prominent Christian missionaries who came to India. And in fact, in, in the, the Gita press, in their English translation of Tulsi Ramayana, Tulsi Ramcharit Manas, they quote this missionary and they say that uh, if any Westerner wants to understand the Indian mind, this is one book they absolutely need to read. Because no other book has had a greater influence on the Indian mind than, than Ramayana. <laughs> so, okay. so, so the point I was thinking of is that the Ramayana itself uh, starts with this question. Uh, what, what are the characteristics of an ideal person? So, and is there an mm -hmm. ideal person like that? In fact, that's, that's the discussion which Valmiki has with uh, Narad Muni. And then Narada yeah. describes Ram to him. And then he gives yeah. him the inspiration and through, through a circumstance, happenstance or we'll say divine arrangement, he gets the meter in which Ramayana is eventually composed. So, yeah. Uh, this question I have been pondering on that uh, when I, I wrote a book on the Ramayana or wisdom from Ramayana and life and relationships. So Yes, you are quite a writer. <laughs> no, I'm doing some small writing. So it was. Uh, so there was. It was reviewed in a few places in in Times of India, in Financial Express, and others. So they were uh -huh. both. They were. Uh, they were appreciative as well as critical. One thing was, uh, some of the one of the authors who reviewed it said that, that I don't think the Ramayana has been explained ever in this way, in terms of how it can help us to improve our relationships. I brought some. Uh, some analysis and insights about how misunderstandings occur, say, between Sugriva and Wali. And so in that sense, they were appreciative. But what they were critical of mm -hmm. was that so all the ans all this relationship problem solutions in this book culminate in bhakti. So if you are not interested <laughs> in that, you may not find this book very appealing. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like bhakti, you won't like this. Well... <laughs> What can you say? Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I told Giriraj Maharaj, he says, that criticism is the perfection, he said. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, you can take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I would like uh, to discuss, if, if I'd like to discuss this topic of, you know, in what way is Ram a perfect human being? And then maybe you can share some thoughts. So um, the now in some ways, what is the ideal person? There may be some cultural specific ideas of an ideal, but still mm -hmm. there are even in the age of moral relativism, also still there are certain values that are always appreciated. And I'll say if one value could be selflessness or sacrifice, putting the other person mm -hmm. before oneself and doing something for others. So, so my understanding is that while Rod Ram exhibits many virtues, that one virtue that permeates the whole epic is this 
virtue of uh, of selflessness of a mood of sacrifice so it is to honor mm-hmm. his father's word that he goes goes to a goes to the forest and it is to uh, it is to honor his word to his wife that dashrath allows his son to go to the forest although that was worse than death for him then lakshman also has no obligation to go sita also in one sense, sita is in a sense obliged she is wife but even then ram has to ram actually tells her don't go to the, don't come with me to the forest you stay under the protection of bharat and she has to insist even up to the point of challenging ram's masculinity in shri ram tells ram tells sorry that's a very interesting exchange that happens there <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a really What kind of a man are you? <laughs> so, she, so then Ram revealed her idea. I would love to have you come with me, but I didn't want to impose this on you. So then she sacrifices, and Lakshman has no reason to go. So then uh, now, when Lakshman goes, his wife doesn't go with him. She says, "I'll also come with you." He says, "No, if you come with me, I'll have to take care of you." but i am going there only to serve sita and ram and then the later tradition says that he or she says no no you won't have to serve me i'll assist you in serving them so he does it he 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 realizes that she will not listen like this that he says that you can assist me in another important way he says right now i have two duties one duty to my older brother and the other duty to my parents and when both of them are in the same place i could do both duties simultaneously but now when they are separated i can't do both duties so you stay here and on my behalf you serve my parents and that is the yes. best way you can assist me so it's a yeah it's all a very moving uh, and inspiring uh, narrative and then of course completely voluntary is bharat sacrifice he has the, he has the kingdom dropped mm-hmm. in his lap we could say without doing anything on his own and yet he doesn't accept that he accept the responsibility without the without the facility without any comforts it's said that he lives in a forest and he performs actually more austerities than ram also because he oh, has, oh he says that it's like he eats barley cooked in cow urine for the entire exile as a ram in the forest yeah. he gets a variety of fruits and other things so yeah. so that mm-hmm. mode of selflessness that is there so the way i analyzed it in because one of the most troubling past times is what i said is of sita be exiled so I, so what, the way i analyzed in my book was that R- sita's being sent away is actually this culmination of the mood of sacrifice just as ram was n- not at fault when ram was sent to the forest so i compared ram's being sent to the forest by dashrath with sita's being sent to the forest by ram so oh at the end at the end yeah okay at the end because that is uh, that causes a lot of heartburn that uh, in and that is not often heart used. burn not heartburn heart ache heart heartburn is something else <laughs> no 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 they two different things ha- i understand what is for devoting right. no no for devoting there is heart no. ache yeah Are you, what is anyway it's no, a any, <laughs> okay now what i meant is that a lot of people feel angry and resentful because of how could ram deal with his own wife like that and how could a person who deals with somebody like that yeah uh, even be considered god so yeah. so in that sense i was talking from that perspective the devotional perspective is hard take okay so it causes a lot of uh, there is a lot of questions let's put it at that i just so yeah so the way i tried to explain it was that it is the same mood of sacrifice attaining its culmination the point is not that sita was at fault but just as ram was not at fault now just as dashrath didn't want ram to go away but he was obliged similarly ram didn't want sita to go away but he was circumstantially obliged yeah so and that yeah it's it a is a nice parallel yeah the from otherwise you know why would a book which is purporting to say it is going to describe ideal human being describe that very human being abandoning his wife 
when she is pregnant that is something which a normal human being would also not do how would that person be considered ideal so it's when we bring in this mood yeah. of sacrifice that is the time when his wife needed him the most and his natural yeah. natural you could say his natural inclination or natural chivalry to protect her he sacrificed even that for the sake of his kingdom not even just for the sake of his kingdom but rather not that he was possessive about the kingdom but for the sake of maintaining a maintaining citizens on the path of dharma so by mm-hmm. by having that so that was a that is one way one frame of looking at the ramayana of how various characters in the ramayana they strive for for a ideal behavior and all of them some of them go a long way some of them fall fall before a long way and some of them go in the opposite directions Mm-hmm. So, any thoughts on this, Maharaj? <clears throat> yes, that's nice. Um, I would just also say that taking this <clears throat> question, this issue of the ideal person, it seems to me that one of the messages of the Ramayana is that no matter how ideal you are um you know even rama is put into situations where he cannot possibly fulfill his dharma in all spheres so taking the taking the point of banishing his wife at the end he actually has two dharmas one is to his wife his family and the other is to the to the public yeah. as as the king as a kshatriya and the the situation is is either or it's one or the other and he chooses the uh the dharma of of king over the dharma of husband yes yeah. this is the larger good and a similar situation is when he is banished by his father um he he is banished <clears throat> in that case he's accepting uh, the the dharma of obedience to the father over the dharma of being king so there's you made a nice parallel and i guess what i'm saying here is two things there's also an inversion and the inversion is there it highlights that there's uh conflicting dharmas yes which which raises the question and this is uh i think it's um even more so in the mahabharata it's been said the whole mahabharata is uh trying to answer the question what is dharma yes and the only sort of definite answer that's given is uh by lord krishna sarva dharma prityaja <laughs> oh i didn't know that part okay Uh, the, that is the only definite answer. I know at the end, the narration of Mahabharata also depicts. Still, they are perplexed. What is dharma? So, it is a search for dharma, and uh, the Mahabharata also has that same verse in the Bhagavatam has that Mahajano in the Katha Sapanta that you yeah. learn that dharma from the Mahajanas. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but but there's something else going on here. and that is that um on the one side we say dharma is difficult to ascertain mm. but on the other side we see that at least on the on the level of social interaction which is where you know we are generally concerned about dharma that it's actually impossible to do everything that is expected it's not no and this is what the ramayana is saying even if you are 
God yourself. <laughs> Even yeah. if you're so perfect that you are God, you're not going to be able to follow all the dharmas. Uh, there's going to be some conflict. That's and then you have to make a choice. Then you have to make a choice. And as you make a choice, uh, someone is not going to be happy. The, the residents of Ayodhya were very, uh, you know, very sad when Rama left for the forest. And we are all sad when Krishna banishes, sorry, when Rama banishes Sita to the forest. Yeah. So now there's an interesting. I don't know. There, there's an interesting uh, episode, kind of in the middle of the Ramayana, uh, which may illuminate this, or it may just complicate things. Okay. But it's the the famous story of Lord Rama killing Vali. Yes. And as you know, um, that's described in the, in the Valmiki Ramayana. As Vali is dying, he's accusing Rama of having completely departed from Dharma. Mm. And then Rama refutes he, he defends himself. Now, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, later commentators and uh, modern uh, express that they feel that his arguments were not convincing, that Rama's arguments are, they say, oh, they are disorganized, they are not very convincing, one of the arguments is, you're just an animal, and I am hunting, and a hunter doesn't have to, inf you know, doesn't have to walk in front of his prey uh, to say, now I'm going to fight and kill you. <laughs> That's an interesting argument, considering that uh, Vali is speaking to him. So what kind of animal is this? But there's an, an interesting um, point that's made by one of the main commentators uh, named Govindaraj. I think he may be a Sri Vaishnava, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so Govindaraj gives the explanation that if Rama had presented himself before Bali, th there was a danger that Bali would surrender. <laughs> and you may say, well, what's wrong with that? That's great if he surrenders. But <laughs> Govindaraj makes the point that if he would surrender, that would spoil the rest of the story. There would be no longer reason uh, for, uh, for Rama to go to Lanka to save Sita and kill Ravana because it would have all been accomplished in a different way. Um, I'm not quite sure I get all the connections, but that's the argument apparently he makes. Yeah. So then you get this very interesting inversion again, where the reason for acting as he does, as Ram does, is so that Bali will not surrender to him. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> of course, as he's dying, then he does surrender to him. Yeah, that's true. And there's a, a nice passage. Uh, 
Let's see if I can find that. Go ahead while you're speaking. I will yes, try to find yeah, that is, so there are a couple, a few incidents in the Ramayana which are quite troubling with respect to their ethical implications. And this is probably the second or the third among them, while he's killing. Now, among the various arguments, what I find is not all of them are equally strong, but not, not that all of them are weak. One of the strongest arguments he uses is that basically you are an aggressor. You, know, you have taken your younger brother's wife and you have driven your brother away. And uh, you never gave him a chance. So cohabiting with your younger younger brother's wife is like cohabiting with one's daughter. And for that sin, Ram says that I am still acting on behalf of. I am the protector of the community, protector of the world. I am a servant of Bharat, and I have to maintain yeah. law and order in society. So, right. so that is a reasonable and if you consider from the perspective of Atataina, that those both aggressors can be killed without any uh, without any sin being incurred. So, so that is uh, so the way. And now regarding Govindra's explanation, I also had heard that I'd forgotten that recently. But it's striking. So what he seems to also say is that Ram has already promised uh, Sugriva to Sugriva that Sugriva you will become the king. So then, if Vali surrenders, then how will his Promise to Sugri be fulfilled, and right. he will become the king and of king of Kishkinda. And another thing is that, uh, yeah, so those when I wrote on this topic, what I wrote is that we may not find the argument so convincing, but you no, know, the the significant fact is that Wali found it convincing. And Wali actually, it was not just like a reluctant surrender of a defeated person. Wali yeah. actually very movingly he reconciles with everyone. He tells uh, his son to hold no grudge, Angad to hold no grudges against Sugriva. He says, Sugriva didn't cause my death. It is my own action which caused my death. He tells Sugriva yeah. and his wife Tara to stay under the shelter of he tells, sorry, Angad and Tara to stay under the shelter of Sugriva. And then they describe the Rama and the reason why Ram's arrow, Ram is known as Amoga Sharam. His arrows never missed their mark. So the reason why that the arrow didn't kill him immediately was because he was the son of Indra and Indra had given him a necklace. That necklace yes. would, would ensure that the person wearing it would live no matter how wounded they were. So now he could have very easily given that necklace to his own son, naturally. But he gave it to Sugriva. So that means he wanted to make amends over there. So, 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 in a sense, if say, there is a case, there are there's a case between say, if say, sometimes there's a, some argument between the husband and the wife, and then they patch up, but some third party comes and says, hey, no, 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 this is unfair, and they are actually making things worse among them, <laughs> and they have patched it up. So, <laughs> in this case, Ram and Wali, Wali accepts Ram's arguments, and Wali, it's not a reluctant, it's a wholehearted surrender and transformation. So in that sense, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um, that, I, that is the most reasonable explanation I came to. You no, wanted to read some more. Nice point too. I just thought we can read um, Bali's response to uh, to Lord Rama. I found it. This is Kishkinda, Kishkinda Kanda Sarga eighteen, starting verse forty two. This is the critical edition translation. Um, by um, this fourth volume is translated by Professor Rosalind Lefebvre. Um, so he's, Bali says, <clears throat> please do not find fault with me even for the unseemly displeasing words I spoke before by mistake, Raghava. For you understand worldly interests and know the truth, and you are devoted to the well being of the people. Your immutable judgment about determining crime and punishment is correct. You know righteousness, therefore, with righteous words, and righteousness is, of course, translating the word Dharma. 
Therefore, with righteous words, comfort even me, known to be a flagrant violator of, of righteousness, dharma. Like an elephant mired in mud, Vali cried out in distress, his voice choked with tears. Then looking at Rama, he said softly, I do not grieve as much for myself or Tara or even my kinsmen as I do for my eminently virtuous son, Angada, of the golden armbands. Then he goes on to uh, express his concern for his son and his son's future and so on. So, mm, yeah, there is this change in heart, uh, we can say, on the part of uh, Bali. <clears throat> As he lies dying, there is a change in heart. And this we might compare, it just occurs to me, I'm thinking aloud, uh, to uh, the death of Jatayu. <laughs> I don't know, this may be a stretch, but... Chitayu, of course, is uh, fighting for Lord Rama when he's fighting Ravana, and R Ravana overcomes him, and he lays, he's lying there dying, and Lord Rama comes. Um, we can say it's not a change of heart, but it's, it's his perfection now, because Rama is present before him as he's leaving his body. It's a very touching moment uh, in which the, yeah, there's a perfection there, whether it's Rama's perfection, I would say it's Jataya's perfection, uh, just to have given his life uh, for Rama and Sita. And there is a similar perfection, of course, for uh, Vali in that he is dying at the hands of Rama, we understand. But sort of putting aside the, the bhakti element and the understanding that if you're killed by the Lord, you're liberated, uh, still he has had a transformation. Uh, he's had a change of heart. Uh, which kind of invites us to see the bhakti principle. So I find it difficult to understand the critics that you mentioned who are saying, well, if you don't like bhakti, then you may not appreciate this, this book uh, because the, <laughs> the Ramayana, I mean, what is it if it's not about bhakti, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, okay. What happened? Let me clarify that. Actually, my my uh, publisher chose to position the book as a self-help book based on the Ramayana. Right. So, so then they felt that self-help should not all culminate in bhakti. So that was their <laughs> mood. But then, yeah, I agree with you. How can you talk about that? Uh, ultimately, the Ramayana is about bhakti. So of course, it's, the not only, just... it's the only self-help there is. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautifully put, yeah. The only real self-help is to find the Supreme Self. <laughs> that is true, Maharaj. Beautifully put. So, uh, so, although in one sense, Ravan Wali was killed by Ram, and uh, Jatayu was killed on behalf of Ram. Mm -hmm. We are saying both attain the same destination uh, ultimately. You know, that, uh, well, that was that the parallel you're making? Uh, that, I, I'm speaking more not about destination so much as about the dramatic moment. They're both before Rama as they are dying. Oh. And, and that moment, it, it's a very powerful moment in both cases. Dramatically speaking, it's a very 
you know, special, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a perfection, whatever the perfection may be, we understand it's, you know, moksha, etc. It's back home, back to Godhead, and so on. But uh, just from the, from the point of view of the drama and the issue of perfection, being a perfect person uh, in this world, we can see that those moments in both cases are, uh, are themselves a kind of perfection, a kind of, yeah, clim certainly climactic moments. But mm -hmm. you just pointed out there's a delay uh, in the death of, of Bali or Valin, he sometimes, yeah. And I happen to have, I wanted to share an interesting detail because we, we were mentioning before that there's so many versions of the, the Ramayana um, mm -hmm. in different parts of the world, uh, which are making assorted adjustments to the story, we may say, which resonate with particular cultures. Uh, and so the Ramayana is very well known in Indonesia, all over Southeast Asia. Um, it's also known, excuse me, in China uh, within another story, uh, another famous work. It's known in Japan and uh, recently uh, it's been made into uh, an animated film in Japan. Uh, there's also uh, an American animation which was done, oh, what is her name? I'm not remembering now, but she, uh, it, <laughs> she did a, an animation called Sita Sings the Blues. Oh, you I remember it. It. Sita Sings the Blues, yeah. You can find it on YouTube, I think. Uh, and anyway, that's a very different version. It's, it's a kind of, uh, uh, you can say a, a feminist version, sort of taking Sita Devi's perspective. But here is something from a book called Ramayana in the Arts of Asia. It's a kind of uh, big picture book. And oh. it's describing different famous episodes from different traditions. So one section is the Battle of the Brothers. And first it gives a summary of the Valmiki, Valmiki Ramayana account. And then it gives a short account from Khmer which I guess is Cambodia, mm -hmm. uh, the Rayamkar or Ramakerti, it's called. And here it's translated as Rama shoots his arrow at Bali, who catches it and sees his name on it. He sees his name on the arrow. He places that arrow on his head in respect. He's respecting the arrow because it's coming from Rama. But he accuses Rama of improper behavior for interfering in the fight of others since he should protect living creatures. Rama offers to recall the arrow but Bali refuses because he will not plead for his life. He releases his grip on the arrow and the arrow pierces his body, flies to the sea for cleansing and returns to Rama. <laughs> That's amazing. And then it goes on Tara uh, falls in grief at the feet of Bali's body and laments. This is divine retribution for some wrong you committed long ago. 
The ground is now your royal couch. Actually, this is in Valmiki Ramayana, close. Uh, with a forested hill for a pillow and the star-strewn sky as a canopy. The wind is your music, the moon your torch. And then Indra descends. You mentioned Indra. Mm. Descends from heaven and sprinkles perfumed water on Bali, granting him passage to paradise. Holy men in the forest recite from the sacred texts for his entrance into nirvana, the state of absolute bliss and freedom from pain. So I guess this is, uh, you know, some Buddhist uh, influence or elements are there. Uh, he, he attains nirvana. <laughs> yeah. So this is interesting. Now, one of the most, uh, if in first time I read it, thank you for sharing all these. I knew that there were variants or other retellings with different degrees of, uh, of uh, harmony with the original in different parts of the world. But I didn't know there was like one book where all of them are available or many of them are available. No, it's not many, it's a handful. Okay. Um, yeah. We have one scholar, by the way, in Oxford, uh, who uh, is retired now. And he has been, hit, most of his academic life, he's been studying the Ramayana. And now he's continuing to study the Ramayana, uh, he and his wife both. Uh, in particular, they are, cataloging the different versions of Ramayana from different parts of the world. So it's, uh, it's, it's a years long project that they're working on. Oh, okay. yeah. This is John Brockington and his wife, Mary. Very nice people. So anyway, uh, yeah, different versions. So, and yeah. speaking of different versions, I want to little bit advertised because I found it just so nicely done. There is a three volume rewriting, you can say, a, a creative uh, presentation of the Ramayana done by Vrinda Devi, uh, Vrinda in America and her mother, um, Annapurna is the illustrator. Uh, beautiful illustrations and amazingly nicely written with an emphasis again on uh, the perspective of Sita. Um, but very tastefully done and I would say very uh, well uh, you can say venturing into the inner life of, of the personalities of Sita, of Rama, of Lakshman, how Lakshman feels as he is with Sita and Rama, some of the awkwardness of being with Sita and Rama you know, over many months and years and a lot of very amazing insights, I would say. Oh, okay. That's it's, called, it's a trilogy called Sita's Fire. Yeah, I've heard about it. I've not yet read it till now. Other devotees also told me about it. I found also Krishna Dharma Prabhu's Rama and rendition very beautiful. Mm. In fact, uh, as compared to, it's this brings us a bigger, bigger question, Mara. That you know, say that the Gita Press has tried to accurately translate into English, but it seems that to translate into a particular language, if somebody, for them to be really good in that language, it's not just like the linguistic expertise, but there's a natural flow. So it's one thing is like linguistic expertise, other thing is writing ability. So that joy yes. of reading, uh, 
reading a well written text that doesn't come just because a text is well translated in terms of accuracy and fidelity so yeah it's a it's a dynamic thing yes Now, a good translation a good translation of any um major text becomes itself a classic uh in the western world the, the i think best example of this is uh what's called the king james version of the bible uh this was a translation done in i guess the 16th or 17th century mm. and it became it became it became the core of english literature it became hugely influential uh, the style and everything about it and it continues you can say to have it influence although now there are so many later translations but none of them compare in uh sort of the use of language uh, the beauty of the translation i think many would say so yeah that is there um as far as translation of ramayana goes i suppose time will tell as far as english translation we do now have this uh seven volume translation of the critical edition yes uh with uh it has also extensive notes which i think is interesting it includes um uh, many points that are made by the main commentators in the notes so it's not neglecting the the sort of classical commentators oh okay that's interesting because i don't think the mahabharat critical edition was like that of course mahabharat doesn't have that many commentators also it is too big to be commented on mm. yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> So going back to your point, Maharaj, just one or two uh, concluding points I wanted to make. I yes. was listening to these various retellings. Yes. Uh, there is one of the most provocative retellings I read was what is called the Jain Ramayan, and it has more or less a similar uh-huh. storyline, but with some differences. Uh, but the key thing is, throughout while going in the forest, uh, Ram meets Jain sadhus, Achha. and at the end of it. <laughs> when sita enters into the earth their rendition is ram becomes enlightened and becomes a jain ah. so <laughs> <laughs> of course he has to become a jain <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a good example of a i think the term is cultural appropriation yeah uh, and so is is it known roughly when that um Jain version appeared. It's a good question. I never thought about historically. I can check. Okay, so, 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 but then Jain Ramayana never became accepted as a mainstream in India. Hmm? Yeah. So there is this thought I had that, like you talked earlier about different retellings, there is the Kalpa Bhaya that is there, and the Lord's Past and Unlimited. At the same time. in always unlimited it's not unlimitedly stretchable so there are some retellings which just go against uh, the against the core storyline or the core mood of the epic so i have been thinking about uh, about this topic and uh, i thought of a metaphor i think it's based on something i had read elsewhere that is like a it's like a ramayana is not just a book it's not a, it's a living text it's a, like a performance so the valmiki ramayana is like the original singer or musician and all the other retellings are like people who are joining in the orchestra and to the extent those who join in the orchestra harmonize and enhance the singing of the core singer to the extent they are welcomed and embraced but if anybody starts singing disharmoniously then they are left out so in that those 
those retellings which say enhance the flavor of bhakti to ram while of course adding their own their own flavors while adding their own nuances enhancements but as long as they enhance the flavor uh, they become accepted and otherwise they are rejected so now how do we know that something enhances the flavor broadly i thought of two things one is that it it shouldn't at the very least it shouldn't contradict the direct storyline of the valmiki ramayan and it shouldn't directly con- it shouldn't contradict the the uh, not just the philosophy philosophy is one aspect but the like the rasa the mood of the ramayan now of course whether these are like absolute criteria and who is going to judge whether the mood is being contradicted that opens a pandora's box but in general hinduism was never a very organized religion which could like legislate that this is this is authorized and this is rejected so yeah but why i it's not that just because there are many retellings of the ramayana doesn't mean that there is no core to it or there is no soul to it there is a very vibrant soul which has affected and animated all the ramayans and if that if that soul were not there then none of the other ramayans would have any appeal because one danger in yeah. saying that but i think that was one of the reasons why one of the authors who wrote an article one of the scholars who wrote an article about how there are so many ramayans now he, he received a lot of flack from some some hindu community leaders because at least yes. the video is construed as a public yeah they came the hot issue uh, a few years back in, yeah i remember in delhi and yeah, one of the main reasons why that happened in my understanding was that the implication that was uh, brought out from his work whether he intended it or not was that that you know, because there is no because there are so many written in ramayana and nothing is uh, none of them are really authentic so that was the problem because otherwise there are so many retellings which have survived and uh, i don't think anyone has uh, militantly opposed any retelling mm. just because it differs from the valmiki ramayana yes but okay that gets into a <laughs> it gets into the hot hot political sphere but i i would argue that even if that's the case that uh he was that the sort of bottom line of his article was that there's no uh authorized ramayana that in itself is not uh an argument for removing removing his article uh from the syllabus even if everyone wants to disagree with what he says let everyone read what he says and then you can argue against what he says that's education not that you control um you know you ban the article people shouldn't read this it's going to disturb them no make it ha- have if it's going to disturb then you should have strong arguments against it but everyone should be able to read it and get both sides that's an interesting perspective if i may well, come if i may put that idea but it's it's if we're talking about intellectual culture which i think is what we're trying to do in the university level then uh you present you present your arguments you say okay here's a purva paksha in effect what this ban of that article was doing uh was saying we're going to remove the purva paksha and we're only going to have our siddhanta Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand that. That's yeah. how I, I see it. <laughs> in, prin- no, in principle, I agree that uh, banning anything in today's world just doesn't work. Is, what is that? I read a thing. Anything that is forbidden actually becomes more fascinating. Yeah. So, it just makes it more attractive. Yeah. <clears throat> so, 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 but the point is that the concern in... Uh, in... Uh, 
in the traditional hindu circles is not that they don't have that there is, there is only the puro paksha in the mainstream academia most of the not if, there are hardly any traditional scholars who have any standing so mm. it is mostly so that, it's like more and more left, yeah the more and more extreme or dis, what from the traditional perspective questionable or leftist interpretations are being given and it yeah. just goes from one limit to another limit to another limit and then ultimately there will be no limit so that is where the That's concern true. was there was one of the yeah. scholars who critique that you know, he had done a very good uh, uh, comparison of at that time you know before wikipedia came an encarta dictionary uh, encarta encarta encyclopedia was quite a good resource so he did a comparison of how uh, islam was treated in encarta encyclopedia and how hinduism was treated so he said that if there are some there are some points which don't make sense they were right for islam that uh, you know there is the there is the principle of incomplex of of something like uh, inconceivability or to the to the will of allah because of which things can't be understood and exactly similar point in hinduism so hindu philosophy is riddled with incoherence and with incoherence and contradictions that mm-hmm. that that make it untenable for the modern logical mind to accept so right. it was, so throughout the bias could be seen so i think that no, ban no, no, no. that burning and that that particular ban, that particular protest was like a pressure cooker ex- giving out a whistle yeah. after a long time of uh, opposition something just burst out i agree it yeah. actually did more damage than good because it only is painted those who are opposing as right wing extremists and removed uh, what do you say it overshadowed whatever due concerns they had and painted them into and made them into a corner and furthermore i think it just proves uh, another point uh, as you said there's no representation of the tradition uh, in the academy and this is one of the uh, unfortunate results of the fact that in india um except for a few private universities there is no um departments for the study of religion yes and therefore there's no um there's no there are no channels for people who are interested in religion to become qualified academically so that they can you know bring bring a balanced argument which can be taken seriously uh the the traditional scholars um are kind of you know they they live within a certain um a certain kind of world of presuppositions which modern scholarship doesn't know how to re- they don't relate to so how are they going to interact to to simply ban something is not really solving the problem yes that's true so this is i think uh, therefore mm-hmm. we are starting with govardhanika village you know yeah. you're right there uh, yeah. we have a uh, bhaktivedanta research center which now has affiliation with university of mumbai uh, and we now have a few post uh, postgraduate students who are preparing they're getting training by devotees in scholarship uh on the level of masters and uh doctoral research yes i had a podcast with gorang pro also about drc i think that is one of the most intellectually promising projects we have and once in one sense in india 
we have reached out to a lot of intelligent young people through our college outreach mm. yeah at the, uh, at the same time uh, if they become devotees many of them become brahmacharis afterward they don't know how to engage their intelligence adequately because not right. all of them may want to become become recruiters preach preachers in the sense of recruiters so what right. more can they do yeah yes maharaj <clears throat> So it does seem that. Uh, so if I understand, and that's Varnashram Dharma. That's Varnashram Dharma facilitating the Brahmins to do what Brahmins can do well, uh, which is uh, research, teaching, education. So they should be able. They should be facilitated to, to do that in the modern context. Okay. That's what. that's what the idea is mm-hmm. i believe you are also one of the guides over there isn't it maharaj for the vrc well i i just i just gave uh, i just taught one <clears throat> one module um on research skills and uh we just completed that i still have to mark all of the assignments <laughs> for this oh that's okay. good yeah i think they send me the links to the videos the some of the students i know them quite well so i look like uh-huh. quite a quite a rigorous process researching for academic publications it's a yeah mm, yes maharaj so yeah so we want to get the, we want to get the students up to speed um because unless they can um you know follow these kind of standards of the academy um uh, there they won't be able to they won't be able to publish they won't be able to get positions where they can teach all of these things there are skills that are required um like for any any uh, specialty so we're trying to we're trying to train up uh, students to have these skills so now that was let that's one last question i want to take to so you mentioned about within the academic drama yeah oh, oh. yeah sorry you're yeah, coming back to ram only but uh, about ramayan see from a traditional perspective when i mentioned that and say there was no centralized uh, system for authorizing or rejecting uh, yeah. but uh, Uh, how would you consider from a devotee perspective that uh, whether the aca- now the academy might go into a, too much of a critical or deconstructionist mode but as devotees we also understand that krishna leela is uh, for, for, from our perspective say krishna we focus on krishna more than ram krishna leela is uh, unlimited and when we go to vrindavan and we hear from some of the local rajwasis or say dinamandu prabhu tells some stories which he has heard from local rajwasis they add to the flavor of what we know about krishna so mm. do you know whether in our tradition whether any any criteria have been uh, given for determining which stories of krishna can be accepted and which can't be accepted there is bhakta samaj mm. talks about that shastra praman and loka praman and many yeah. of these stories would fall in loka praman but then yeah loka praman becomes in which praman of which lokas that raises a question also yeah well and uh, i think it's always going to be blurry boundaries i like um, that blurry boundaries. boundaries okay porous boundaries because and i think that is also one of the strengths um who is who is patrolling the boundaries we may say and i would say that is where the uh gurus and the sadhus function so you <clears throat> you mentioned uh our dear dinabandhu prabhu mm. telling uh, sharing much of the loka uh lokika katha so he makes a choice that here is a story 
which will enrich the devotees. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell it. We, we all respect him as, as, a, as a sadhu, as a very good follower of our Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. And I would just, I don't know if he does this all the time. I don't think he does all the time. But best would be if when he or someone else is narrating such a story that he's saying, that he's uh, kind of announcing, this is a local tradition. This is what the villagers say. Mm. So that the next person who hears it doesn't then, he may share the same story, but he or she will also make clear, this is local uh, kata, local tradition. <clears throat> According to, you know, the Bhagavatam, this and this and this, local tradition says that. Uh, the local tradition, we share it perhaps because it enriches our appreciation of Krishna. It also enriches our appreciation of uh, local, of Rijbhat, excuse me, Rijbhasis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they also are to be respected. We understand they're not ordinary, and so um, they can be respected. Um, but I think the, the boundary patrol is always going to be essentially guru and sadhu. Sadhu, shastra, guru, vakya, hridaye, kuriya, aikya. Yes, uh, that's true. So, with respect to like the small, I don't, I don't want to use the word disclaimer for it. That is a local tradition, but it just a uh, maybe just a note can be there. So, just uh, one point that raised in mind, even what to speak of telling other stories. You know, even when we tell stories of Krishna, uh, there is a certain amount of creativity involved in it. If you are going to make a drama, yeah. we can't uh, just yeah. literally take a, the whole dialogue from the scriptures. We have to we add a little bit more, uh, flesh out the characters a little bit more, add some more dialogues. Yeah. So, so um, when I wrote my book for Ramayana for the first time, I was very hesitant to put any words in the character's mouth. But then it became the whole book the whole story was in passive or passive, it's like uh, indirect speech. Yeah. So then it became very, very dead kind of story. The, the story aspect of the story was gone. It was like a, not a story, but a report of the story. So, uh -huh. so then I started using the direct speech over there. And of course, I don't like put words in the character's mouth, obviously. But still, there is a certain amount of creative license required when we when we talk about telling the stories. Like you earlier mentioned in the in the uh, the Sita uh, Sita trilogy, uh, when we talk about the emotions of the the inner emotions of the characters, there is a certain amount of creativity used in it, and, and that that is explained by Srila Rupa Goswami uh, that. Uh, for the purpose of drama, writing drama, it is permitted uh, to make adjustment to Shastra as long as the rasa is right. Mm -hmm. If you get the right rasa, and I think this gets back to what you were saying about harmonizing, you know, if, if there's essential harmony, then we may add we may accept uh, some variation. So yeah. that's what that's that's what Rupa Goswami says explicitly um, in his what is it called? He wrote a textbook on, on yeah. drama. Nata Chandrika, I think. Yes, Nata Chandrika. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. And so, that. for example, Harida, um, not Haridas. Um, um, <laughs> not Haridas. 
the the famous dramatist Kalidas. Kalidas, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so in his Shakuntala, he takes from the Mahabharata the story of uh, uh, Maharaj Dush, Dushanta <clears throat> and Shakuntala, and he turn he. He elaborates, he tells some, um, he, he puts a twist into the story. He adds, he adds the curse and so on. That uh, Maharaj Dush, Dushanta or Dushyanta uh, loses his memory because of a curse. Um, in the Mahabharata, there's a very different kind of, he's actually just playing like he forgets because he needs to first uh, established that indeed Shakuntala is his wife for the public. So his purpose there is, you could say, a dharmic, dharmic purpose. Mm. Um, because he explains, otherwise, otherwise, you know, if I just accept you now, uh, people may not accept you, and then it's going to be a big problem. So he, he keeps putting her off, acting like he's forgetting, acting like she's making it all up. And then comes, I just read this a few days ago, then comes a voice from the sky <laughs> yeah, saying, this is your wife, come on. <laughs> but the point is, the point is that Kali does makes it a, Rather different story, but um, I would assume that Srila Rupa Goswami would say he keeps the rasa, so it's okay. Mm. So, you, so, so even drama is not a, like a like a frozen genre. Even modern novelizations you could call as dramas, because mm, modern novels are not exactly plays. So, but still the rules we could apply here also. Yeah, I think it's a good general, general principle. Mm. Makes sense. And as, as for uh, embellishing, as you said, to make a, a drama, we may want to perform in a Sunday feast program or whatever. What I have uh, encouraged devotees to do is to have minor characters uh, speak with each other in such a way that uh, they may bring in some additional, you know, points which are appropriate. And in that way, uh, you you kind of re you, it's a kind of safe position. I think you can make it so that uh, you're not taking, you can't be accused of taking too many liberties. Yes, that's true. I think we had a podcast discussion on this, on using our imagination Krishna service. And you had mentioned yes. this point. Yeah. So, yes, Maharaj. So we could, uh, in one sense, if you're going to talk about rasa, there is no way really emotion and ima imagination can be separated entirely. Because Ultimately, emotion is meant to trigger the imagination, not in the sense of imagining up things, like imaginary things, but using our imagination yeah. to visualize the ultimate, re visualize realities. So, so yes, Nana. So, thank you, Maharaj. Should I try to summarize? Please. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of discussion today. So we started yeah. today with... Uh, a uh, brief overview of pertinent prayers. So the first prayer of the Shavta Sotra, where very, very graphically and vividly, Ram distributes Ravan's ten heads to the, as offerings to the ten directions. So we could consider it as, as poetic or we could consider it as having happened find some other kalpa. And then we discussed the Bhagavatam verse, which is offering a Almost summarizing the prayer, summarizing the pastime, and then offering a prayer, it made this Lord protect us. So we discussed some aspects of those that prayer also, and then uh, we discussed eleventh canto, the Tektwasu Dishtaja, 
verse and how it refers to ram and um, you discussed from the lagu bhagavata amrita the commentary of because mommy from about that also so then uh, we came to how is ram an ideal person that was the theme and there two three things was the mood of sacrifice and service which you mentioned and then you do this very elaborate in the parallel between say ram sending sita away and dashrath sending ram away and then we talked about the the ethical some of the questions raised with respect to ethics with respect to wali's story and uh, you mentioned how wali is actually convinced at the end and so that aspect of govinda raj saying that this is so ram acted in such a way that wali wouldn't surrender so that the story would go on that's quite a beautiful beautiful reading of it and and then you also mentioned about how the ramayana has influenced so many countries and cultures where they have had different variants of the ram ram lila being depicted and then of course before that you mentioned about how ramayan it is a experience it is a living experience that they discussed about this how we can keep hearing ramayan and it's ram lila and it's still reliable and this western scholar who went to varanasi and went went to banks of ganga and actually saw it so everybody knows the story but still they relish it because they are participating and experiencing it and uh, then uh, and it, it's being reenacted oh, sorry re participate re reenacted it's being reenacted the, the sense is that it's real it's happening again the leela yeah. is happening again yes i remember one point which i forgot to mention there that i had also read one author's article i don't know whether it's the same one he said how if ram becomes if some character is playing as ram then they treat that person actually like ram they do the puja of that person and if the the he might yeah. be the son of a father but the father for that day will bow down to the son treating him like ram so in that sense it is actually a reenactment itself and yeah. uh, and uh, then uh, it discussed toward the end about uh, various we talk about the various various retellings of the ramayana and how what what how how far are the boundaries for us so one theme i mentioned is about the harmonization like a musical orchestra and then you said that we can't really uh, ban things we discussed about that many many ramayana translations and the deconstruction that happened because of that and the solution to that is not banning the book or condemning the author but it is actually getting tradition getting the traditional perspective uh, presented in the academia and that can be done if we have more educational forums where the facility is available that's not available unfortunately much in india but the bhakti and research center is one thing that is coming up that has already started off and then with for for the living tradition right now the boundaries patrolling would be by the gurus gurus and sadhus and uh, so there is a laukik praman also which is used say for example when we hear krishna leela and uh, when so there are two different things one is considering uh, the past tense which are not given in scripture and how how to accept them or not and the other is you the past tense that are given in scripture how do we enter more into them so for that there is some amount of uh, character development which is authorized to some extent by rupaka sandhana chandrika and you also mentioned the the caution that could be taken is for dramatic purposes have uh, minor characters who speak the relevant things without having to so that we don't we are not accused of taking too many liberties and ultimately imagination and emotion the naturally related so we can't divorce the two if precise to be experienced imagination has to be stimulated and that's why we can all immerse ourselves in ram leela any any points i left out or anything you want to add maharaj uh maybe just one small point to add which um has kind of fascinated me since i read it some years back um that i think it was uh the the 10th century aesthetician um ananda vardhana who 
who said that the dominant rasa of the Ramayana is karuna. It's karuna rasa. Karuna oh, is karuna a is sense. Of, it's a sense of compassion, but it's also a sense of <clears throat> of pathos. Um, in a sense, the Ramayana, in, with within, the, let's say this, the Valmiki Ramayana. He's speaking about the Valmiki Ramayana, which is considered the original because Valmiki is the Adi Kavi. So this is poetry. So poetry has to express rasa. And the dominant rasa, he said, uh, is, is karana. And if you look at it from that perspective, it's very interesting to see how the, uh, the whole story of the Ramayana is actually deeply moving because yeah. of the feelings of separation, Ram from Sita, especially. So there's the hero, there's the Vira Rasa, of course. Rama is, you know, killing Ravana uh, and so on. But uh, to identify Karuna as the dominant Rasa, I think is fa very fascinating and also inviting for us to understand the Valmiki Ramayana is uh, deeply nourishing to our bhakti. In other words, we don't have to think, oh, I'm just a, I'm a Krishna bhakta. I don't have anything to do with Rama. He's, he's all about Dharma and rules and regulations. That's not for me. No, it's, it's deeply about uh, it's deeply about bhakti and on on the level also uh, of viraha, but it's the particular flavor is karuna. Beautiful viraha. So earlier you mentioned also about abhava. That is also a, a praman, the absence of. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is beautiful. I had heard about Karuna, but I didn't know it was Anand Vardhan who had said that. So then it, it, it now it gels very nicely with the Viraha Bhav. So how are Karuna and Viraha, are they synonymous? Or Karuna is more the more like in English would call it pathos. And separation is one way of feeling pathos. I'm not an expert in these things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to speculate. Um, but I would I would understand karuna in in relation to pathos, whether they are, you know, coextensive meaning may not be appropriate. Uh, okay. but but with karuna, of course, I think there's something additional, which is the sense of compassion. Okay, so, yeah. so who is feeling compassion for whom? Well, you can say Ram is, is uh, having compassion on all of us. He's showing compassion um, to everyone in the story in one way or another. He's showing compassion to Ravana by killing him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That's true. I think yes, Maharaj. That's beautiful. Thank you, Maharaj, for adding that, and thank you very much for your association. This is very so wide-ranging discussion on the Ramlila. So, so who comes next in our series? <laughs> oh, our Aradhidev, Krishna. Oh, Krishna is counted. Okay, there's different lists of ten avatars. So oh, we're we want to go start. to we want to go to Balram then, of course. We can do, or who, who do you prefer? Or Balaram and Krishna. I don't know. Or we end up, or we do 11. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Balaram and Krishna is a good idea. Because if you have to speak about Balaram, you really can't yeah. speak much without speaking about Krishna. Exactly. Uh, and Krishna will become like too big in one sense to cover in one session also. So you can too focus much. on Balaram and their relationship with Krishna. 
Exactly. That sounds good. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. I look forward to your association next month, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna